Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Brett Perlman, President and CEO of the Center for Houston's Future, a nonprofit um, that's been at work for more than 20 years. Uh, for those of you who don't know us, welcome. Uh, the center brings together business, government, and community stakeholders to engage in fact-based strategic planning, collaboration, and action on issues of great importance to the Houston region. Uh, we do that by engaging in economic research and strategic planning, by hosting events, uh, by doing webcasts and conferences, and engaging in thought leadership. Uh, via our twice annual business civic leadership forum, we inspire leaders to become more involved with the community. Our three current strategic initiatives are focused on energy and climate, uh, the economic importance of immigration, and health and health equity. Uh, we've been working on energy and climate over the past four years and are currently working on uh, ensuring that Houston becomes a clean hydrogen hub. In addition, uh, we've been running a webcast series of which this is part and uh, over the last year. And so I'm very pleased to have um, uh, Dan Cohan, the Assistant Associate Professor of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Rice and a faculty fellow in the Baker Institute Center for, uh, Center for Energy Studies with us. Uh, he has served as a Fulbright Scholar in Australia and is the author of over 50 peer-reviewed publications. His book, Con uh, Confronting Global uh, Climate Gridlock, How Diplomacy, Technology, and Policy Can Unlock the Clean Energy Future, was released in March and will be the subject of our discussion today. I'd also like to welcome back our moderator, uh, Raj Mankat, who's the op-ed editor at the Houston Chronicle. He has a PhD from the University of Houston's creative writing program, and has edited and written for publications that specialize in economics, philosophy, literature, architecture, uh, science, and health. Congratulations also to Raj and his editorial board colleagues on yesterday's Pulitzer Prize announcement, which was really fantastic. Uh, so as we get started here, feel free to put your questions in the chat during the conversation, and Raj will work the questions into the conversation. Uh, so Raj and Daniel, thank you for joining us, and I look forward to the conversation. Thank you, Brett. Pleasure to be here. Thanks so much for, for having me. It's a real honor to moderate and talk to, uh, to, to Daniel. Um, I have a tremendous amount of respect for him. So my main job at the Chronicle is I'm the op-ed editor, and I receive so many submissions about energy, and it's hard for me to judge them sometimes. I, I, sometimes they come in from people with vested interests. Sometimes they're not disclosed. And I'm thinking about crime and highways, and I, I often turn to him to help me think through this subject. And he, the reason I do that, I trust him because if you are familiar with his work, and, or if you get his book, or uh, you'll, as you'll see, he really turns issues over um, from multiple perspectives. He thinks about industry, he thinks about ordinary people, he thinks about the environment, and he's he's a very fair honest uh, broker, but at the same time, he's also unafraid to make a, a strong judgment and call it as it is. So I just really have a huge amount of respect for him. So let, let's, 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 start, let's talk about your book. Uh, when you wrote, wrote about it for the Chronicle, you um, told the story about how it actually started off with a different title and there was a bit of a false start uh, and you had to sort of Start, start over. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. So in the Chronicle, I, I spoke about the, the first title for the book. We went through a few titles before we ended up with Confronting Climate Gridlock. But, but you're right. It started out being a book that was going to be called Climate of Opportunities. I really wanted to tell the stories of the opportunities to address climate change, how um, business people, entrepreneurs, uh, venture capitalists, others were finding profit, were finding opportunity to um, to profit from addressing climate change, but um, spoke with people, went to site visits where people were really struggling. Uh, went to Michael Skelly's uh, firm um, the, that was trying to build a, a clean grid, trying to build transmission lines from the Oklahoma panhandle to, uh, to Tennessee. And they kept being blocked every step of the way. I went out and visited Proterra's electric bus factory and Tesla and uh, the port of Los Angeles and Long Beach. And, at each step, they were running into gridlock. They were running into problems um, addressing things. And around that time, I was actually um, on a Thanksgiving vacation uh, and went with my mom and daughter to a, an escape room. And uh, we actually failed to get out. But in the escape room, you had to find a number of keys. And unless you had all those keys, you couldn't, you couldn't open the lock to get out of the room. 
And uh, so realized that, that there were a few keys that needed to be obtained to, so that those opportunities could be more successful, so we could break through what really was uh, a climate gridlock. So it was gonna be escaping climate gridlock for a while with an escape room theme. Um, briefly, when I finished the book, the editorial board just wanted to call it climate gridlock. And I absolutely uh, resisted that. I said, no, this is not a book about the problem. This is a book about the solutions. I could you know, talk for weeks about the climate change as I'm an atmospheric scientist by training, but, but this is a book about solutions. And so it needed that confronting, confronting climate gridlock to, to really be what I was trying to convey in this book. Yeah, I, my, uh, I remember the quote you you included from uh, Michael Skelly, uh, where he says, you think I'm making money from this? Um, and and uh, his whole effort to, um, you know, connect, to make money by connecting uh, clean energy is kind of, uh, to better to the grid with transmission lines. It, it fell apart at a policy and a political level. So I, uh, one thing I love about the book is it, 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 uh, at first, it steps back and it really sets a, a policy stage. It helps. It, it really helped me understand how we got to the Paris Climate Accords, and mm -hmm. uh, and why why it why it's important to understand what's why the accords sort of fail in many respects, but we still have to go with them as as a, as a basis. So. Um, could you could you talk about the the way that you talk about the CFC uh, the success with uh, with regulating chlor fluorocarbons mm -hmm. and uh, why that kind of top down approach at an international level it worked with addressing the ozone ozone layer right why why didn't it work with with uh, with carbon and, and climate. Right. So, so as an atmospheric scientist and someone who studied environmental policy, um, the Montreal Protocol, the way that we addressed the ozone hole, the ozone depletion, both scientifically and through diplomacy and policy, that's sort of the pinnacle of, of the ultimate achievements of, of atmospheric science and, um, and associated policy and diplomacy. That was the first time, and, and I think still the only time, that a Nobel Prize in chemistry has been given to atmospheric scientists for the three scientists who most pioneered understanding the chemistry of why uh, the ozone layer was being depleted. Um, and it was just a few years after we even realized there was an ozone hole. For a, for a long time, NASA had been adjusting its satellite and filtering out any real low readings because they knew that couldn't be possible. But um, once we realized that there was a hole, once we realized the problem and CFCs were causing it, um, we started controlling it in the US within a few years. And then we made it a global treaty, the Montreal Protocol, just a few years later. And uh, by 1987, with President Reagan and, and with the near unanimous uh, Senate, that became the law of the land and, and the law globally to, to get off of CFCs. And I think there was this euphoria coming out of that, this sense of, okay, this is how we solved uh, the ozone problem. There must be some analogy. There must be some similar way to do the diplomacy of uh, climate. And so uh, we had uh, the, Re the Rio Treaty, the, the Earth Summit, when we pledged how we would address climate change, I think we made the mistake of learning the wrong lessons from uh, ozone depletion, is that there were efforts uh, in the Kyoto Protocol to think that just like the Montreal Protocol had, uh, had uh, the limits that were set in uh, back rooms in uh, international conferences, and then it became uh, implemented in domestic policy, that was kind of what we tried to do with the Kyoto Protocol and realized, well, you can't get the Senate to, to just agree to something that that Vice President Gore or others have, have negotiated in the back room of, of conferences, uh, it needs to come from the bottom up. And so it took us until the Paris Agreement in 2015 to realize that if we're going to get something done, we need to realize the sovereignty of each country. We need to realize um, that countries aren't just going to go with their, what, their, uh, what their diplomats say, but we need to sort of build up from the bottom and have a treaty that's, that is essentially by peer pressures, essentially by one country at a time deciding how much they can commit to control their emissions. Right, I mean, and, and really, the reading the book drove home to me how much the Paris Climate Accord is what the United States uh, really negotiated and called for. It was, it was in, in many ways a victory for the, for, for the US negotiators to have these non-binding um, bottom-up uh, pledges um, and, also to have some uh, inclusion of the developing countries, even though 
their pledges uh, are often weak. Um, and in, in, you have this. I, I I hope some of the folks in the listening or, or in the in the call are are uh, game theory nerds because I I love that the book gets into the prisoner's dilemma, mm -hmm. uh, and you use that to explain how we can figure out how to use the Paris Climate Accords to move forward, how to, how to get unstuck where, um, you know, if the United States moves fast, then we put uh, ourselves at a competitive disadvantage while other countries, say China or India even, um, keep polluting and they, 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 they uh, have a, they, they can produce energy at a lower cost. So how how do we get out of that, and how what are what the what are climate clubs? Right. Well, I think it should take a step back. Is that first? I think what uh, Senator for Houston's future is working towards, what many others are working towards, is, is there are still those opportunities to to profit from addressing climate change. There are still, in in many ways, benefits that that can outweigh the costs. So, um, so I think I presented the prisoner's dilemma. I also presented ways that that it's not just um, we don't necessarily just benefit from. From acting badly, and that it's not um, a, a zero-sum game or, or a competition where we're trying to one outdo the others. But, but there are lessons I think that that come from game theory, come from from seeing it, however flawed, as a prisoner's uh, dilemma. That that really give us lessons. Now that we're in this Paris Agreement world, what do we do with our pledges? Because essentially, what we have is pledges that get issued, and and every time there's an annual summit. So it was Glasgow. Last time we have these annual follow-ups to the Paris Agreement, we have a, a fresh opportunity to restate our um, our pledges. Like President Biden uh, dramatically increased uh, the strength of the U.S. pledge last time around, um, and we have a chance to see what other countries are doing. So what what I said that this uh, is like is an experiment that the Professor Robert Axelrod did uh, back in the 1970s, where he did not just a, a regular prisoner's dilemma, but an iterated game of 150 rounds of it. So for those who don't know the prisoner's dilemma, the idea is that you have two prisoners, uh, two, a comp, two uh, co-conspirators in a crime. They, they were accomplices in, in whatever the crime may be, let's say a, a bank robbery, and they're held in separate prison cells and they have to decide as they're being interrogated by uh, the police and the prosecutors, do they, um, cooperate with their accomplice? Um, do they act nicely to their accomplice and, and not rat them out on it? Or do they, um, do they act mean? Do they, do they rat out their uh, accomplice? Do they defect from their uh, conspiracy and, and tell on the other person so that they get uh, a weaker uh, prison sentence or they can get off? Um, and so they would both be better off if they, um, if they both essentially stayed silent and cooperated with each other, but not knowing what the other one has done in their uh, prison uh, cell, they would be individually better off just um, ratting on the other person. So what does that mean for uh, climate diplomacy? Well, what was fascinating about Professor Aksharad's experiment is he actually went out and got the best computer algorithms he would find. He went out and surveyed and invited to his competition all of the best game theorists who had been studying the prisoner's dilemma, or had been studying other uh, economic games and economic game theory, and asked them to write uh, computer algorithms of how they would program a computer to play a prisoner's dilemma one-on-one -on -one against other um, algorithms. And so people wrote very complicated code. They looked at um, what would happen. And when you play the game, you can see what's been done the times before, just like at the Paris Agreement, you can see what countries have pledged before and the winning strategy was from a, a professor Rappaport, a, a math professor who who just sent two lines of code. And this was Fortran code that that Axelrod and his grad student had to enter on punch cards. We're talking 1970s. Um, but the very best way, the way that you get the most points, the way that you outperform any other uh, approach over time, is a simple tit for tat, where you act nice at first, so you um, you cooperate with your co-conspirator at first. And then any time that, that the other uh, prisoner doesn't act nicely, you retaliate once. Um, and then you forgive right away and you go back to being nice if you can. And what that does is it elicits cooperation. You could have just been nice, but then the opposing algorithms would learn to just take advantage of you. If you're not going to retaliate back, um, then that doesn't help. Uh, so what tit for tat means is really four 
uh, properties that we need countries to follow in their diplomacy. They need to start out being nice and, and see if they can get others to, to do so. Uh, they need to retaliate like tit for tat and uh, that not just being nice no matter what, but if you retaliate, not out of proportion, but just sort of a one for one, uh, that elicits the best cooperation, that elicits niceness from others. And then uh, be forgiving and be clear. This tit for tat strategy was so simple, so clear, that the other strategies could figure out what it was doing, even though they've been pre-programmed from scientists or game theorists around the world. Um, and so it elicited the most um, kindness, the most niceness from others. And it, it's strange, it didn't beat any other one strategy, but it's, uh, it won overall. And so what does that mean for, uh, for diplomacy of what countries need to do is that the US has not been nice. The US has not cut its emissions um, nearly as fast as it could. It has higher per capita emissions than anyone else, but what would make US really pivotal and why I focus so much of the book or most of the book on what the US could do is that the US is really good at being retaliatory, is that whenever the US decides to do something, we make the rest of the world go along. And so with the Montreal Protocol, the EPA had already banned certain uses of CFCs and we needed a protocol to make sure other countries did that too. Uh, whenever you see proposals for a carbon tax, like I interviewed Secretary of State James Baker for this book or interviewed um, some of the retired uh, Republicans who have founded various groups, talk to people in the business community who have uh, business proposals for a carbon tax. Every single one of those is paired by something essentially retaliatory, by something that would put an export, uh, put an import tax, put a, a border adjustment tax that would make sure other countries had a carbon tax too. So we haven't actually put that carbon tax in, in the US. We haven't actually been nice with our carbon policy yet, but if we ever did, uh, the US would be uh, retaliatory, and it gives the U.S. more leverage, I think, being the biggest uh, import market, being the biggest developer of technologies, being uh, the largest economy in the world, gives us a way that, that if we ever were nice, we could bring more followers along than something like the European Union that's, that's nice without being retaliatory and hasn't brought followers with it. I, I, I think that one of the points you make is that the United States at this point isn't the largest emitter, right? So if we if we focus only uh, if, if we focus on if, if, on reducing carbon emissions in the United States, you could argue, well, that's not really going to address the, the global problem. But you outline this way, this tit for tat method of, of the United States pushing and pulling uh, other other countries along with it. And and I think one of the things that's happened since just the last time I've talked to you, and certainly since this book uh, was published, is the the, the uh, war in Ukraine. Um, and we can already see uh, uh, sort of how this could play out uh, um, internationally. Um, you sort of see, we can see sort of these outlines of of, of uh, a grouping of nations and 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 retaliation for uh, in, in oil and gas. Um, I see that. We have some uh, questions in the chat. Folks are, all, are are ready to talk about how this plays out, uh, you know, at a national level and how it, how it would play out for for corporations. Um, so, can you kind of break this down for, uh, say, a, a U.S. based company or a Houston based company? Um, can you, or, or maybe the the other way to break it down is to talk about um, the way that Hurricane Harvey and um, the winter storm affected your team. Right. Um, yeah, so, so a few things there. One is, is that you said the US going alone, we're no longer uh, the number one emitter with China having surpassed us about a decade ago. Um, yeah, we only emit about 14% of the world's emissions, which means that I, I do, do an exercise with, with my students in class where we use this this interactive model developed by MIT from their climate models. And, and we look, what if the US achieved President Biden's goal of, of net zero, that would be enough to avert about two tenths of a degree Celsius or about three tenths of a degree Fahrenheit of warming, but we would still end up uh, with at least three degrees Celsius of warming, far above the, about a degree above the Paris Agreement targets. So we need, the US needs to clean up, but they can't do it alone. Um, and you brought up these, these um, these huge uh, events that shifted thinking, you brought, brought up uh, Russia and Ukraine, brought up 
uh, the Hurricane Harveys. I'm not sure how to tie those. Sorry, uh, I brought up a bit too together. much. Um, right. But uh, I think each of them has has really shaped our thinking and shaped our priority of what we're trying to do uh, with energy in ways that um, could be responded to and, and could keep us ever more wedded to the fossil fuels that power 80% of the energy economy uh, in the US and globally, or could be a, an opportunity, could, could provide openings for, for greener forms of energy to move forward. So it's all about how we deal with them. So with the first one you mentioned with, with Russia and Ukraine, the, the big uh, jolt that it's provided is all of a sudden uh, natural gas prices have gone through the roof. Uh, not so much in the US where, where they have, have more than doubled uh, and that's, that's been sizable. Um, or tripled from their lows, but in Europe, natural gas prices are five or 10 times what they had been in recent years. Uh, the equivalent of, of nearly $300 a barrel oil of what they're paying for natural gas. Um, and there's been this, this rush, oil prices have gone up, but, but not actually as dramatically as, as natural gas. And there's been this rush to, to have energy security, to not be as dependent on, on Putin and Russia's oil and, and gas. So. Do we respond to that on the traditional supply side? Do we respond to that with, with drill baby drill and with more uh, LNG export terminals here, more import terminals in Europe? Or do we respond to it with, with doubling down on, on efficiency and, and cleaner energy? Because the biggest competitor to most um, efforts towards efficiency, the biggest competitor for, for wind and solar is natural gas, which is typically the marginal player of, of electricity. And so it, it really gives all the more reason to, to go more into to wind and solar, to develop geothermal opportunities, to develop other ways. If you look at how much wind and solar are generating right now, it offsets as much uh, natural gas demand for US power plants as uh, the total amount that we export as LNG. So essentially wind and solar are what allows US to send uh, what some congressmen I think call freedom gas to, uh, to Europe that, that has been freed up because of uh, wind and solar. So you, know, you think, oh, you just have to drill baby drill to address energy security in, in Europe, but, but actually clean energy, actually efficiency can, can even play a more uh, rapid role. And, and so I think who, who wins that narrative? Is the narrative that we need more oil and gas and more um, exports of it, or is the narrative that that, that we have been so addicted to oil and gas um, or other parts of the world really addicted to, to getting it from, from Russia or from places that have been unstable in the past and in the Middle East and, and do we need to go a better route uh, forward? Um, yeah, I think you've addressed this sort of cognitive, cognitive dissonance that, that uh, all, all of us are picking up on, right? Like, uh, the, but, it, but you, you, you sort of resolved it, right? The, the push for a transition, push for to, to renewables, actually, even in the short term, would mm -hmm. enable a uh, greater export of, of natural gas. It's, they're, right. they're, they're not necessarily mutually exclusive, um, at least in the, in the short and, and medium term. Right. And then you brought up uh, Hurricane Harvey, and I think needs to be brought up in the context of of the 2021 uh, blackouts that we had with the Texas freeze, and and even uh, as you were mentioning before this call, uh, this uh, this week or even yesterday, Houston power prices hitting uh, five thousand dollars a megawatt hour, thirty times what they are in other parts of the state. And uh, in May, that, right? So this this idea that that we still have to be worried about blackouts, we still have to be worried about um, crazy price spike. Right? If the price is spiking that high in May, you know, are we at risk of outages in in August. Um, and so I think um, two key messages there. One is just how vulnerable we are to, to climate extremes. I, I would call Hurricane Harvey a climate extreme. I wouldn't call uh, the February blackouts a climate extreme, but we need to be prepared for all forms of, of extreme weather. Um, but this sort of heat wave that we're getting this week, I just got back from San Antonio where it was a record 101 degrees, uh, hottest it's ever been in early May. Um, the climate forecasts say that even if we hold warming to a, a two degrees, Paris future, um, we're going to have in most parts of Texas, 10, 20, even 30 more days a year that get above hundred degrees. Um, so we need to be prepared. That means your heat waves start stretching into May and into September where it's not just going to be July and August that will be challenging um, for the grid. But wait, what, what happened on Monday? Like how did we end up 
because what the Chronicle reported is that just on the other side of Matagorda Bay, the prices right. were negative. Right. And uh, over here, they were uh, over five thousand dollars per uh, megawatt hour. Uh, yeah. So um, different. So what? How did that happen? Yeah. At first, heading into Sunday and Monday, some people were wondering, would we have problems statewide? Because we were we hit, we were projected to, and then we hit uh, by far the highest ever demand that the grid has had um, this early in the season. You know, May before our summertime peak. Um, but then we thought we were off the hook because it ends up sometimes when you get a heat wave, the winds can be really slow. But this time it's been a pretty windy uh, dynamic heat wave. And, and we've had solar go, go from one gigawatt to 10 gigawatts. And those really carried us through and made so we had plenty of power um, statewide while we had this huge demand. But at the same time, uh, I haven't heard Chronicle had a short story about it, but um, the there was a fire at Plant Parish. Ironically, at the one uh, coal unit, coal power plant that's been touted uh, by the Trump administration and others as the exemplar of, of clean uh, coal. Because for a while, before they mothballed their equipment, they were the only coal plant in the world that was capturing uh, their CO2. Um, and that very same unit that, that had been capturing its CO2 for a few years uh, caught fire over the weekend. and. Uh, and a second of the four units there also went down. So we lost enough power for, for a few hundred thousand homes at that you know, supposedly reliable power plant that has also gone down. It, it's coal pile froze during Harvey and it's coal, sorry, it's coal pile froze during the 2021 blackouts. It's coal pile got waterlogged so it couldn't operate after Harvey. And so we had this situation where locally we lost uh, supply uh, worth a couple hundred thousand homes. Um, while we had plenty of wind and solar in other parts of the states, we had this, this bottleneck that there was plenty of cheap power uh, from South Texas, from West Texas, um, but this local shortage that we just, we need more transmission lines to, uh, to bring it in. So I think it showed, like I put in the, in the, the essay for the Houston Chronicle uh, last month, showed this need for better transmission, both within the state and beyond the state, but also showed you know, this fossil fuel system that we've been relying on this where we put most of our eggs in the basket of natural gas and coal historically uh, really hasn't been serving us so well, not not just in terms of the air pollution and climate damage that it causes, but but it hasn't been nearly as reliable uh, as it should be. I, I think this is where and, and I see a really tremendous number of questions, uh, good, good questions coming through and I, I do want to get to them. And, but there's uh, sort of this one point I, I want to explore a little more, and then we'll come to these questions. So you talked about investing in the grid. Uh, what I found so uh, honest and, and fair in, in your scholarship is that you acknowledge that uh, the problem when the sun doesn't shine and the wind doesn't blow, you acknowledge the the, the vulnerability that we would have uh it, it didn't it, it, it was wrong to blame solar and wind for the uh the uh power failure uh last year but moving forward uh if we if if the wind capacity and, and solar capacity keep growing at the, at the rate they are we really could be in a bind uh if you know if if the sun isn't shining and the wind isn't blowing um, so you talk about the need to invest in transmission, sort of even out uh, where we're getting solar and wind from, because I guess you could explain this. It, right. it, it will be shining, sun might be shining somewhere else, the wind might be sure. blowing somewhere else. But even then, is that is that enough to, to create a, a reliable grid? Right. So so I went out, I, I mean, this was a book really of, of exploration. So I interviewed... Uh, around 100 experts for the book, including people like Professor Mark Jacobson, who, who think that we could power the grid entirely with, with wind, water, and solar. Um, I didn't come out thinking that was the most convincing. I think we do need other sources besides just wind and water and, and keeping the hydro and nuclear plants that we have. I think we do need other things to balance it, but, but where the expertise has gone is even as stark uh, debates as you have among different experts, where the where the expertise, where the, the world is trending is that if we want a cleaner grid, it needs to be mostly 
uh, wind and solar, but we need to balance it uh, with something else. And uh, the costs, since I began teaching my energy course uh, at Rice, or even just over the past decade, the costs of solar have fallen by 90%. The costs of wind have fallen by more than 70%. At the same time, as, as nuclear has gotten far behind schedule and far over cost, there was just uh, reporting out today by the Associated Press saying that um, that the Vogtel plants, the only two new nuclear reactors that are to be built in the United States since Three Mile Island in the 70s, that initially were uh, projected to be seven billion in cost, um, the latest estimate is now 34 billion uh, in total spending. Once the process project is done, it was supposed to start in 2016. Now they're hoping to get them started in 2023. Um, so just. If you looked and I talked to experts of where they thought the grid would be heading uh, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, when they were doing scenarios, they thought new nuclear plants, they thought uh, coal with carbon capture was going to be a big part of uh, the story. And it just hasn't panned out that way. The, the carbon capture at the coal plant got mothballed uh, a year ago before, before, it, um, before that unit caught fire this week. Nuclear, you know, who can, you can do that in Georgia where the ratepayers are going to be stuck with paying that uh, through their monopoly utility, but in ERCOT, in a place with a competitive market, uh, no one's ever going to take the risk of, of a $34 billion uh, power plant. And so uh, by far the cheapest, about five times cheaper than nuclear is, is wind and solar. And so we need to balance it. Even if you, yeah, there are added costs for transmission, there are added costs of storage, but when something is five times cheaper, you can add in those other um, sources and, um, and and there still is a need to figure what else will blend with it. I think for short-term storage, we're fine with with lithium-ion batteries. I think for for some degree of blending, we're we're sufficient if we just add enough uh, transmission capacity. But we will need some other uh, features. I, I got excited about what I was seeing with some uh, Texas-based entrepreneurs of what they're pursuing with geothermal that I think could be a big part of the mix uh, in some parts of the country. But I think we need to be open to um, to a variety of technologies that might emerge. So let's just come back to the Petronova plant and the, 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 the one that caught fire, right? Uh, this, is, this is nearby. We're talking about the Sugarland area, Fort right. Bend, right? So, I mean, um, I mean, it was operational for a while, uh, and I think the, the decline in oil, oil prices at the time uh, made, didn't make it cost effective. And in your book, you're, you're, you're broadly skeptical, not just of that uh, attempt at, at carbon capture and, and, and utilization of storage, but, but more broadly. I mean, why is that? There, there, there are major companies in this area investing heavily in, in carbon capture. Well, I'm, I'm skeptical of carbon capture at coal power plants, because when it comes to power plants, we have so many ways to replace them with something cleaner. That it just doesn't make economic sense. It doesn't make environmental sense to, um, to, to keep you know, 30 year old coal plants going in ways that actually need to burn more fossil fuels to power the, the carbon capture. There, there is a crucial role though for carbon capture in other ways is that until um, green hydrogen is able to scale up, we're making over 95% of our uh, hydrogen from natural gas. Um, that produces a much more intense concentrated CO2 stream than uh, coal power plants or even natural gas power plants produce. So it's uh, far more cost effective, but far cheaper dollars per ton to start capturing CO2 from sources like that, from the hydrogen producing or the ammonia producing plants, where Texas really can be the lead because we produce uh, more chemicals, in including more hydrogen by far uh, than any other state. Uh, natural gas processing has CO2 streams that could be affordably uh, captured. Ethanol plants uh, in the Midwest have uh, costs of carbon capture that are a fifth of what it would be from a coal plant and don't have those, you know, you can't replace ethanol or hydrogen or ammonia uh, with wind and solar like you can uh, the power plant. So I think, I'm not saying throughout the, I'm saying, yeah, I don't think there's going to be much of a role for, for the old way, for the way that we did carbon capture uh, at Petronova, but I think it, it is crucial to um, to start developing and deploying carbon capture at the intense industrial uh, facilities right away. And I think it remains to be seen whether it's going to make sense to try to do carbon capture out of thin air. For, for now, the costs of that are, are enormously expensive, uh, probably on the order of $300 a ton 
um, for now uh, definitely deserves R&D to, to try to bring those costs down to perhaps $100 a ton, but, but still there's, that's only going to make sense if we take a world that's emitting 35 billion tons a year of CO2 now, only if you shrink that you know, by a factor of four at least, get that down to the single digits, does it, does it start to make sense to, to really deploy, um, deploy the, those large scale negative emissions technologies at, at scale? There's no way you can catch up with, with the emissions we are now by, by the negative uh, emissions approaches. So those technologies, though, are are expensive, right? So can can you link the conversation we had at the beginning about the sort of the international treaties about tariffs and carbon taxes? Can you link that to uh, making the 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 economics for say uh, blue uh, and and green hydrogen? Can can you? link that macro policy, international policy to what these companies are trying to do. Yeah, I mean, right. At the big macro policy, both domestically and internationally, um, there is no reason to do uh, carbon capture or to, um, yeah, there's no reason to do carbon capture and sequestration unless there's a policy that makes you do it, is that pulling CO2 out of the air is, is the ultimate sort of prisoner's dilemma, is that there's a collective good, there's a global benefit to, to capturing the CO2, but there's not a, unless there's some value put on the CO2 uh, or policy that, that requires it or incentivizes it or taxes emissions or, or something, there's no self-interest. There's not even a local pollution self-interest because if we're talking CO2, its effect on local air quality isn't, isn't really a big deal. And so you need some sort of policy or diplomacy to make this um, make sense. Other things can make sense for other reasons. There are reasons why, you know, wind and solar can outcompete um, coal and natural gas, even just on a cost and on an energy security and reliability basis, if they're blended together right. Um, electric cars, I think, could get to a point with economies of scale that, that in five years' time, I expect they will be cheaper uh, than gasoline or diesel uh, vehicles. But, but to make carbon capture make sense, to, to get away from from gray and brown hydrogen and, and move to, to green or even blue hydrogen, um, you need um, policies that really push that forward and um, in one way or another, uh, put a value on, on reducing or capturing CO2 emissions. So let me just try to drill it down and make it as concrete as possible. So, uh, so we have this question, if a publicly traded company uh, is supposed to serve shareholders, how do they break out of the requirement to provide the most Profit and I, so I'm thinking about hydrogen, right? So Russia has identified producing hydrogen as one of their uh, energy priorities, right? And um, they produce huge amounts of natural gas. They, they've been identified also as a, a major methane super emitter, uh, uh, really large number of super emitter sites in their uh, uh, natural gas production. So presumably the, the hydrogen that they would put on the market, it well, it could be uh, more carbon intensive than, say, uh, a, a hydrogen that's produced uh, with carbon capture in this area. So how, how, would, how would the economics work so that, you know, it would make sense for uh, a company here to invest billions of dollars in producing that less carbon intensive hydrogen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I mean, somehow, at least at first, until, until the technologies and costs change, it's, it's more expensive to make clean hydrogen than dirty hydrogen. And so there needs to be um, policy or sort of a policy equivalent that's made by companies or, or made by groups like the Center for Houston's Future that are pushing for a hydrogen hub and pushing for a carbon capture hub to to make there be a market to create that initial market for cleaner hydrogen while it's still um, while it's still costlier than the dirtier forms. I think one thing that you have is you bring up the blue and the green hydrogen, and you have different situations there. And I think you, you have a real competition emerging there. Blue hydrogen is something that that can take the way we're already making hydrogen from natural gas and just capture the CO two uh, from it. 
that can only really do much good if you clean up the rest of the natural gas supply chain. So we just published work a couple months ago showing uh, the terrible air pollution and health effects that come from uh, when we don't do oil and gas the right way and, and it's being flared or, or if it's not flared, uh, leaks and vents uh, that, uh, that can cause large amounts of methane emissions. So a lot of problems if natural gas isn't done right. If you do natural gas in, in the most, uh, in the cleanest possible way, then you know, it's possible to make blue hydrogen at least competitive. It's still not going to be as, as cheap as green. So it's those who don't follow it, blue is when, you is when you make it from natural gas but capture the, the CO2. Green is, is going to be the cleaner approach. Green is where you use electricity. And as you make electricity in clean ways, you use that to split water and you can have um, a nearly emissions-free way of of making hydrogen. For now, the costs of that are two or three times as high as blue hydrogen, which is probably one and a half times as high as, as traditional natural gas hydrogen. And so, you know, you need markets to be created that, that demand those fuels before they've come down in price and, and create that kind of virtuous cycle like we saw for wind, like we saw for solar, where, where they were being deployed um, because of voluntary corporate actions, because of, um, you know, local and state and national efforts and, and because of policy that, that made it happen, but they need to get to that point where they can become self-sustaining. They need to get to that point where they can scale up and, and really outcompete uh, the dirtier options. I guess, so we, we have one question from uh, Bob Newhouse. He says, please discuss international climate clubs uh, outlined in your book more. I, you know, we, we brought it up, but not really dug into it. Yeah. Um, so how can those be made uh, stable for sustained results. Yeah. So, and I, I guess I'm trying to figure out how that connects to, to all the things we've been. Yeah. So, th so thanks for bringing up the climate clause. That was one of the ideas I was most excited about and really uh, most promote in, in chapter three and, and so many different ideas of how that could happen. And that, it comes from that fact that with the Paris Agreement, we can only um, write, codify into, into the agreement what all 197 parties are willing to sign on to. All these countries are sovereign. So, um, you know, Saudi Arabia isn't going to sign on. Other countries won't sign on uh, if they aren't happy with the, the language. So you end up having a, a treaty that's, that's going to have limitations to it. Climate clubs can be clubs of the willing, clubs of the most ambitious to partner together in ways that, um, that bring their policies together. The traditional way, the way that got the most attention on climate clubs I'm actually not as excited about. Uh, this is when William Nordhaus, who is the first economist to win a uh, Nobel Prize for, for his work on climate economics and climate policy, he devoted his Nobel Prize speech to the idea that we should have climate clubs of carbon taxes. Basically, the coalition of the willing, the countries that are willing to do it should agree on a set same uh, carbon tax and impose export tariffs or import tariffs on any country that doesn't go along. So it's got that kind of tit for tat flavor. It's got that be nice and be retaliatory flavor, but I'm at least skeptical that, that you would ever have one with the U.S. because we haven't been able to pass uh, a U.S. carbon tax, let alone, you know, get a couple dozen countries to, to agree on one. So yeah, in theory, if that happened, that would be great, um, but I'm not sure that's the best approach. What, what I ended up coming to is, is what I think holds the most potential is, is some of the ideas that have been put forward by um, David Victor, a uh, professor at UC San Diego and others, um, where they've seen climate clubs as something that could happen more like the way we do um, World Trade Organization deals, a, a much more flexible and dynamic approach where you get together countries, you get together coalitions of, of countries that are willing to work together and they each pledge something very much like the way you pledged into the Paris Agreement of something they will do to, to earn membership in this club. Um, and so it could be um, providing technologies to other, it could be developing clean energy technologies and then providing them for free or at low cost or, or giving up some of the patents so they could be used in developing countries. And then perhaps those developing countries would, would find ways to avoid fires on the palm plantations or the, the peatland fires in Indonesia or the burning of the Amazon rainforest or other things ways that they reduce emissions and, and they would benefit from those technologies. So, so really a way that you don't make it all just about setting a carbon tax, but you give different countries the way uh, to join in uh, and you need to have perks of membership. You need to have 
a carrot and a stick. You need to have reasons to join and 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 benefits that you would lose if you uh, pulled back out. But but somehow, you know, I know NAFTA has a, a nasty ring to it, or you know, we we decided not to be part of the the Pacific uh, trade deal. Um, but but I think there is merit. There are ways that can be worked together and. I hope that the United States is is part of one and leading one, or, or even leading multiple. These these could have overlapping um, aims, but I think countries can really use to their advantage uh, the opportunities to scale, the opportunities to share technologies, the opportunities to to leverage what they're doing to get others to do more. If if we go through this flexible climate club approach. Okay, now I'd like to swing back to the to the to the particular. Uh, back to the local. So we have this question from Eric Williams. I love this. It's checking in from the Midwest, Nebraska, wow. where farming happens around the base of wind turbines and rural communities have dual crop revenue from wind and out agriculture. But I'm interested to hear more if there is any more information discussion about life cycle analysis on the land use for renewable energy production compared to uh, to, car, uh, to capture through regener regenerative agriculture. Um, well, that's, that's a pretty uh, interesting, it involves question. I'm not sure you can speak to that, but another question I wanna sort of pile onto that is the, the battle that's taking place in rural counties mm -hmm. over siting these uh, renewable facilities. And if you can speak to you know, where are these, where is all of this supposed to go? Uh, and yeah. what's the best way to avoid, you know, um, where, where should these things be cited? Yeah. So with the life cycle question, um, people point, point that out, you know, you need to make these turbines, you need to make these solar panels. That's not absolutely emissions free, but uh, the experts who look at this, such as at National Renewable Energy Lab, you count in all those life cycle things and you count those trucks that I always see passing by as I'm driving up to Dallas with uh, carrying the wind turbine blades, you add up their diesel, it's still one tenth or less as much emissions, all that that goes into it than uh, the cleanest operating fossil fuel power plant. So absolutely, it's clean, but, but you're right, it is a big land use um, issue in that um, we need to find ways for, um, for uses such as agriculture and ranching that I think coexist very well with, with wind. Uh, yeah, we need that to be used rather than seeing a wind farm as something that totally has to be devoted. There's been studies out of Princeton and I spoke with, um, with Jesse Jenkins uh, and others who've looked at, and they've looked at uh, how much land would you need to devote to wind? How much land would you need to devote to solar in order to uh, get to a net zero economy where almost all their scenarios that what is the cheapest, what's the most reliable, what's the, the best way to get to a net zero economy by 2050, uh, has the vast majority of its power coming from wind and solar. And, and they show that it would be sizable amounts of, of land. The actual land that the wind turbines would sit on would be minuscule, but there would be you know thousands of square miles from which you could see um, wind turbines. We need to find ways that, that wind farms um, coexist with other purposes, and we need to find ways that uh, that uh, the solar footprint is smaller, but but it still will be sizable amounts of land that that would be devoted to solar. Yeah, I mean Barbara Brown actually uh, ties into this. Her her question, she says, uh, it's it's uh, it takes out topsoil, uh, not just the turbines, but there's also the access roads, huge substations, massive transmission lines. This land cannot be reclaimed ever. Um, I don't know. I mean, someone who spent uh, four summers in West Virginia, I guess I would challenge the notion of, um, you know, of, of how land is left behind, um, you know, by coal and and how it's left behind by, by other forms of fossil fuel extraction. Where you know, if you just look at the land footprint of, of the power plant that's burning the coal, or the power plant that's burning the natural gas, then then it looks small, but if you consider, you know, all the land that gets uh, uh, mountaintops removed for for coal mining, uh, the streams that are poisoned by that, um, yeah, in theory they're supposed to be reclaimed and and repaired, um, but uh, but often the, the companies go bankrupt. They they make the profits go bankrupt before some of that 
reclamation. So I think, um, you know, the their efficiency is the is the one way that we can um, uh, reduce all of the uh, impacts of of using energy. And uh, but um, the uh, you know th there's always going to be some impacts. The, the impacts that come from from wind and solar uh, across these uh, dimensions is, is is much smaller than than the impacts that we get from. Uh, from oil and gas and, and coal. And it's some where you, you've had repowering of wind. You can go back to the same place and put in a, a larger and better uh, wind turbine. Whereas with coal, once you've, you've mined and damaged one place, um, you end up needing to go to another place. So it, over time, if you look at this across decades, um, it's a much cleaner approach to, to go with renewables. Okay, there's a, there's a question about, uh... Um, distributed energy. And this is a favorite topic of mine. And there's one thing I wanted that I never thought I'd want to buy an F-150 truck. But now I want one. I want one of the new uh, all electric ones that apparently are set up to reverse, you know, flow the energy into your house. Uh, so this sort of serves as, as backup power. So I'm imagining this like vast array of F-150s all across Texas, smoothing the demand uh, on our grid and saving us from another uh, um, another power failure. Tell me, tell me, tell me, I'm wrong. Isn't um, this something to be excited about? It is. I mean, I think because it's finally making a truck that looks like trucks that Texans are used to. Um, you know, maybe the cyber truck appeals to some people, but I think for a lot of people who want to be driving a pickup truck, it needs to look like and perform like the pickup trucks they're used to. But but for the clean options for electric vehicles, say to win the day, they need to not just be cheaper or or same cost as others. That to really go up fast in market share, like we need things to do, they need to be to be better. They need to be sexier. They need to have something that appeals beyond just a spreadsheet. And I think if you did a a return on investment on that F-150 repowering your home, it's probably not worth it. It's probably not uh, that many hours that it's saving you from a blackout, but but it sure is exciting. It sure is uh, reassuring to think that it can do that. It's something that you can't wouldn't, do before. Wouldn't microgrids, if, if we think about a whole bunch of microgrids, isn't that a more uh, sort of sustainable way of, of addressing and something we can achieve instead of these huge transmission lines that that would connect across states and regions. We could, but it's um, it's not such an equitable. It's a not so equitable and, and difficult solution. I mean, engineers have uh, scientists, civil engineers, has identified um, the electric grid as the most impactful you know, engineering innovation of of the twentieth century. Is that it, for all of its problems, it allows you know at hundreds of millions of people to have access to electricity more affordably, more reliably than any other way possible. Uh, there's, even though the large grid can go da down, um, you know, it's not feasible for those who can't afford to put solar on their roofs and a Tesla power wall in, uh, in their garage, um, you know, to be able to make this accessible to the masses and not just in the US, but, but in other countries that, that need to scale up, there are, there are economies of scale, there are advantages to large, there, there's certainly advantages to distribute, and there are places where where that makes sense. But the idea that we can just uh, do away with the grid and 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 all go onto microgrids, I think, is is a bit of a fantasy. Well, we're 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 almost out of time, so I I want to uh, ask you the you know sort of the big question, like what's the main, what's the final word, what's the thing you want you want uh, your listeners to? Yeah, yeah, so so seeing where we are on time, I think two main messages is one is that this is. Um, this is solvable. This is this is a book about solutions and the choices that we make really over the next 10 or 20 years, most pivotally, um, are going to determine whether we're hitting a future that's uh, that's got about three degrees Celsius warming. We've, we've kept ourselves off of the very worst case scenarios, but I think our business as usual would be three degrees Celsius. And, and to have a shot at two, I think we've already lost our chance of, of staying below one and a half, but, but that difference of one degree Celsius is a huge difference and, and the actions that we take over the next decade or two is going to be pivotal to, to where we end up on temperature. And so what we need to do is, uh, is a concept that we didn't get to, but that sort of uh, overlies everything that we've said is, is that we need a way to create 
a push and a pull, is that we need a way to create new technologies that, that create, a, create a supply of new things, that create those uh, better F-150s, that create new ways of making green hydrogen, that create uh, new uh, technologies for, for smaller nuclear or, or geothermal or so on. But, but those are just going to stay in the lab. Those aren't actually going to, to get to the scale that we need unless there's a pull, unless there's uh, a market demand pull that that government can drive through its policies, uh, whether carrots or sticks, that that business groups and individuals can drive by by their purchasing decisions, and and so that virtuous cycle is what made solar cheap. That virtuous cycle is what made wind cheap, and it's that virtuous cycle that we're going to need to start making way for for electric cars, for hydrogen, for carbon capture, um, so that so that those are able to compete and and enter the market in ways that. Uh, that we're going to need to be able to to confront the climate gridlock. Well, Raj and Daniel, uh, thank you for a great conversation. Um, we at the Center for Houston's Future are working on that virtuous cycle. Um, we are working on a um, white paper on hydrogen hubs, which we'll have out next week. And um, uh, hopefully it, you'll uh, we'll get it out to you guys and to the audience. And uh, we can start talking about um, how we in Houston uh, can hopefully work on both the supply and the demand side, and and, and create that um, that future Daniel that you uh, that you talk about in your book. Um, so just thank you all for such a great discussion. We had a very I was just watching uh, the very entertaining comments and the chat, a uh, very animated group. Uh, so you certainly inspired people uh, uh, to participate today. Uh, so thank you all for um, for participating, and uh, thanks to our panelists. Uh, for a really great discussion. Um, I'd like to give you just a brief overview of some of our upcoming events on May 18th at six o'clock. Uh, we're co-hosting a uh, virtual conversation uh, with Rawway uh, Abdella, who's a professor at Harvard Business School and director of Harvard's Davis Center for Russian and uh, Eurasian Studies. Uh, and that will be led by uh, J.R. Deshaza, who is the Dean of the um, LBJ School of Public Affairs at UT Austin. And they're going to be discussing the impact of the Russian invasion uh, on Ukraine on U.S. and global markets. And that is hosted by the Center, uh, by the Leadership Now pro uh, Project, and by Harvard uh, Business School. And uh, please see the registration in the chat. And then on May 24th at noon, uh, we're going to continue this discussion on uh, climate and energy uh, with our colleagues from the Houston Advanced Research Center. And uh, we are just announcing that event also. Um, you can register for that in the chat. And then finally, we're gearing up uh, for our Future of Global Energy Conference in partnership uh, with the Greater Houston Partnership on uh, June 28th through the 30th. And again, I think Laura is going to put the, uh, the link in the chat. So there's lots of conversations, interesting conversations. I uh, really appreciate uh, both of you guys making the time to do that. Uh, I, wrote, I learned a lot uh, and, um, and really look forward to continuing the uh, partnership we have both uh, with the Chronicle and with Rice. And, uh, and I'll thank, thank you to all of you for, uh, for tuning in today. Uh, so uh, great. Have a hope you have a, um, uh, a, a great rest of the day. And thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, take care. Thanks, Brett. Thanks, Raj.